Good afternoon. Miss Terry and I would like to wish all of you a Merry Christmas, a happy, very blessed New Year, and we're looking forward to seeing all of you back out of Fletzy in January. Last Sunday, we brought a message on the birth of Christ in Luke 2. This week, we're going to pretty much finish up with Luke 2. Luke looks at the things that was done after Jesus was born, the things in the Jewish law that needed to be taken care of. And there's a purpose for all this, and you'll, you'll see that when we have the first service in January. But first, we're going to start off with a story by Dr. Irwin Lutzer. It was in one of his books. It was, uh, the name of the book was about, it was about prayer. So Irwin Lutzer is a pastor emeritus of Moody Church in Chicago. He was a uh, senior pastor there for 30, 36 years. Now, the story is, is about a tavern. The tavern was being built in a town which until recently had been dry, which meant no alcohol served. Now, a group of Christians were opposed to this and began an all-night prayer meeting asking God to intervene. And incredibly, lightning struck the tavern and it burned to the ground. The owner brought a lawsuit against the church claiming they were responsible. But the Christians, the Christians hired a lawyer and they were declining responsibility for the fire. Now the judge responded, no matter how the case comes out, one thing is clear, the tavern owner did believe in prayer, but the Christians who were praying didn't believe in prayer. Now this is not a condemnation against any church, but if you're praying for rain, show enough faith to bring an umbrella with you. Now when we read the next, through the next 15 verses, you might miss a point that they cover a period of time, not just a day or, day or just a week or even a month. But they all happen. They all happen in accordance with the law of God and His written word. Now, let's go to the prayer slide. Christmas is about the birth of my Savior. Jesus is the reason for the season. And that's something we need to keep in contact with. We don't need to make Christmas about football games. We don't need to make it about presents because Jesus gave us the present that surpasses all presents that could ever be given. And that was his salvation through his death on the cross. Now Luke 2.21, we'll get to in a minute. That's where we're going to start. But let's go to the word of prayer. First off, we want to pray for the people in Tennessee who were devastated by the tornadoes last week. Today, we're praying for everybody that's in the path of this storm. It's going from Florida up to New England. And Lord, we pray for everybody in that path. Right where we are, they talk about flooding and high winds and different things. But Lord God, we just lift everybody up to you for your hand of protection and provision for peace and comfort in a, a critical time like this. And I believe, somebody told me just a few minutes ago, there was a wreck out on the interstate right across to us, and we pray that, that nobody was injured, severely no one was killed, and we pray that that's cleared up and that people can get moving again. Lord, we pray for Israel. We pray for them, for, for their going through the, the, the trouble of the trying to re reclaim their, their peace. And Lord, we pray for the, the Palestinians too, Lord, that they see that terrorism is not the way to go. We pray for all the ones in the Middle East. Everybody needs Jesus, but sadly, there's a short supply of Jesus in, in that part of the country, part of the world where he, where he was born. Well, Lord God, we just give it over to you. We know you have a plan, and you're working your plan. And what it looks like to us, sometimes it's confusion, and we don't understand. It's working perfectly, just as you ordained it to work. 
So what God can give you to praise the Lord and know that you're the, the one on the throne, that you're the one who makes the decisions, not us. And Lord, we give you to praise the Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now our first verse is Luke chapter 2, verse 21. Now this it says, Now when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now according to the law, a Jewish boy was to be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth, as we see in Genesis 17, 12. He who was born in your house and bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, then again in Leviticus 12, 3, we can see the same with a little bit less detail. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Jesus' earthly parents were doing all the right things in the law at the proper time and place. Now, they were probably still in Bethlehem, but not in the stable, and already eight days from his virgin birth. The circumcision was probably done in a local synagogue, or maybe in a home, but not in the stable. Now Luke 2, 22 and 24 says, Now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said, in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now that's what they sacrificed, the two pigeons, and we'll look at that in more depth in a few minutes. But her purification refer, for, refers to a ceremony in which a new mother of a son was declared ceremonially clean. It took a, took a period of time, it took a period of 40 days. But Leviticus 12, 6 says, lay out the timetable, or it lays out the timetable for marriage purification as we read. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring in, bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering, and a young pigeon for a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Now, as I said, the ceremony took place four days after the birth of the Lord Jesus. The reason these few verses in Luke 2 are, are critical is God is everything God does is on time it's on his timetable and we, we, we see that where I mean I don't, I don't criticize people for doing it but they'll have the baby and the family is stable they'll have the shepherds which is what scripture says then they'll have the the wise men coming. Well, the wise men weren't at the stable. They, they were on a long journey to get there when they, when they saw the star. And the reason you use these, uh, this proof text is because if they'd been at the stable when they went to sacrifice at the dedication of Jesus at the temple, they would have dedicated a lamb because they had gold things and some all valuable things, and that would have meant that Joseph could afford to buy a lamb. But they came much like on. In fact, when we get the first message we do, when we come back in uh, 2024, we'll be on the wise men, because they did come after, after the stable and the manger. But they're an important part of the story of Jesus. But going back to her purification, as I said, it refers to the ceremony in which the new mother and son were declared ceremony. Um, I can turn around that too many times. Leviticus 12, 6, as I said, it lays out the timetable. It says, when the days of her purification fulfilled, brother, son, or daughter, and the reason it says son or daughter is because daughters has, has a little bit different uh, time element in it. That she shall bring the priest a lamb of the first year of burnt offering, young pigeon and turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle. Now at this ceremony, the mother was to offer a lamb 
had a pigeon or two pigeons that they didn't have or couldn't afford to land, as we see. In Leviticus 12, 8. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One is a burnt offering, the other is a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her, and she will be clean. So you see, this is we're talking about a 48-day period after the birth of Jesus, where Mary is not in the stable, because she cannot get ceremonially clean staying in the stable. But Jesus' family, as I said, they chose two pigeons, so suggesting they didn't have, have or could not afford to buy an animal. The journey to Jerusalem from Bethlehem was only about five miles. Presenting to the Lord refers to the normal presentation of the firstborn son to God. Exodus 13, 2 says, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Luke shows that Jesus' earthly parents were faithful Jews who kept the requirements of the law. And as I was saying this, you know, it, it's so important that they did all, you know, they were sitting there and said, hey, listen, we're just, just delivered the God baby, God man, we delivered the Messiah. We're, we're pretty well, we're pretty well set forever because we, we have God with us. But that's not what they did. Jesus' family chose to fulfill all the law that was required, everything that was required in the Mosaic law, the Pharisee, they, they did in relation to Jesus' birth. He was circumcised on the eighth day, on the fortieth day he was presented at the temple. All these things were requirements of law, and it's important because of the sin of commission and omission. You can commit a sin, or you can omit an action that is, is the same as sin. He could have, like I said, well, we just want to have him circumcised. We want to call him Jesus. We'll not take him to the temple. We'll take him when we feel like it. But they did everything according to what the law was. So there was no way anyone could read God's word and say, Jesus didn't fulfill everything that needed to be fulfilled. Luke 2, 25 and 26 says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord, the Lord's Christ. Now, sin is a picture of an Old Testament saint that we read about in Revelation. The only difference is that he met the Jewish Messiah and knew and believed. All the Old Testament saints trusted and believed God, and they were looking forward to the cross while we... Today, you look back to the cross. But how many of us today, when told by the Holy Spirit, we would not die until we saw the Savior, how many of us would stay away? Most of us probably would avoid all the places we might encounter him. We wouldn't go to church. We wouldn't go to prayer meeting. We would stay away because we didn't want to encounter him. We surely wouldn't go to the temple. But it would probably be like the Hebrews in the wilderness. When the Lord sent fiery serpents into the camp, and the serpents started biting the people, the people started dying, they cried out to Moses to, to, to do something. He cried out to God. God said, fashion bronze serpent on this and put it on your staff and hold it up, and anybody who looks at it will be saved. But that was too simple for the people. They, a lot of them looked, but a lot of them wouldn't look because it was foolishness to them. And that's what salvation is, is it's foolish, foolishness to those who are perishing. But they would refuse to look, just as people today refuse to look at the cross. They think it's foolishness. They refuse to look 
They refuse to look at the tomb to see if it's empty. Well, then they would have to make a choice to follow. Follow Christ, the Lamb of God, the Lion of Judah. Simeon was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the comforter of Israel, a hope that parallels the hope of national deliverance expressed and the two hymns in chapter 1, one by Elizabeth and one by Mary. But this deliverance would involve the work of the Messiah. The Holy Spirit Luke highlights the presence of the Spirit at the beginning of God's work in Jesus. The Holy Spirit is always being underestimated, but he is equally God with the Father and the Son. Luke 2, verses 27-31 says, So he came into the temple. And when his parents brought in the child Jesus to, to do for him according to the customs of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people. Into the temple the location within the temple is not given. But Mary's presence suggests either the, the court of Gentiles or the court of women. In verse 2, 30, Sim, Simeon identified God's salvation as being personified in Jesus. For Jesus to come was for God's salvation to come. It is true no other than the Lord Jesus that we can be saved from destruction. Scripture doesn't say where the young family is staying at this time, but for a time they remained. They had already been in Bethlehem for 48 to 49 days, depending on how he was counted. Jesus' birth is a big deal that hardly anyone knew anything about. It was announced to shepherds who were the lowest in the culture. The old man just waited to see his Messiah so he could finally go to glory. If, if he would have been born in a palace instead of a, a stable, there would have been all kinds of people around, puttering around. But because he was born in a stable, witnessed by shepherds who were the lowest of low, he was witnessed by them, there just wasn't that much interest. Even, even when you read in uh, Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men came and were talking to Herod, the, the scribes and stuff, they knew where and when the Messiah was coming. They had a pretty good idea. But they weren't looking for him. If they had been looking for him and studying scripture, as their job was, it was to study scripture, they would have been looking for him. The wise men knew to come look for him, and they weren't even Jews. Now Luke 2, 32 and 35 says, A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of in him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for a fall, for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. What's wrong? Yes, the sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Like to bring revelation to the Gentiles. We miss, we didn't miss it, but the early apostles and the, uh, disciples of Jesus missed it when it talks about like bringing revelation to the Gentiles, the glory of the people of Israel. So, this is the first explicit statement in Luke that includes both Jews and Gentiles. Salvation is portrayed as light. And another thing that Dr. Luke is critical about when, his, uh, when he, he was penning his epistle or his gospel was when he says 
And in verse 33, it says, And Joseph and his mother. It does not identify Joseph as Jesus' father because he's not his father. He was his stepfather. He was the one who raised him up. But he was not his birth father. And jo uh, uh, Luke is striving in his, uh, his gospel that Joseph was not the father, but just the stepfather. But God's blessing with the fullness that had not been revealed in the Old Testament. It would be a revelation to Gentiles because they would be able to participate in God's blessing. Before, unless they became a, became a proselyte, they could not, uh, could not participate in God's blessing as, as a Jew because they weren't Jews, they were Gentiles. They were pagans, they were idolaters. And, but basically, Gentiles is anybody who's not a Jew. But Jesus is the glory of Israel because through him, the nation would see the fulfillment of God's promises. The nation's special role in God's plan would be vindicated. In verse 2, 35, a sword. The image here is of a large, broad sword striking Mary. She would suffer much pain in watching Jesus' rejection. Thoughts reveal that Jesus is a litmus test for, for where people stand before God. He is a judge who will expose the thoughts of all people. Because of his death and resurrection, Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. The living are those who, who in this world believe Jesus is who he says he is, and that is the Lamb, is the Lamb's banner. The Lamb's judgment is for rewards for believers who die or were raptured out. The dead are those who died without Christ will stand before Jesus at the white throne of judgment. That is not where you want to meet the Lord for the first time. Because when you meet him at, for, for the first time at the white throne of judgment, it's going to be because you denied him, denied the power of Christ the cross and empty tomb. You denied it your whole life when offered a chance at redemption and salvation, you rejected it. You rejected it out of hand because you didn't want to change or you thought you had plenty of time to, to be worldly and come to Jesus later. But none of us are guaranteed any time. In this season of Christmas, we need to remember what Christmas is about. It's not about Santa Claus. It's not about presents. It's not about gifts. It's about the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came as a baby, who stepped down out of heaven, who took on flesh, to clothe his glory. And he's what it's about. If, if you don't have any other presence, if you have Jesus, that's, that's the only presence you need. He, he is the, if I was going to look at the greatest Christmas present ever, it would be the baby Jesus. It would be the baby in the manger. It would be the Savior on the cross. It would be the empty tomb. When my Savior was buried and laid for three days and he was raised to glory on the third day. That's what we need to know, what we need to celebrate at Christmas time and Easter time. We you know um, on Resurrection Sunday, that's the biggest gift that we could get. You know, that's that's like the second Christmas. Because what it what it signifies is is because Jesus is raised. We who believe, who trust in God, trust in Jesus, on the last day will be raised too. We'll be glorified. And that should make it even more urgent for us to share our faith with lost people. Because everybody needs Jesus. And, and there's nobody today, there's nobody today who is not worthy of being saved. Now, we've got some pretty bad people doing some pretty bad things. But through the shed blood, they can be redeemed. If you don't believe me, ask the people who the Apostle Paul, as Saul of Tarsus, once he martyred for Christ's name, when he died and went to heaven, all those people he martyred, they stood up and cheered. 
Because that's what the gospel is. Is everybody needs to hear it. Everybody won't accept it. We understand that. Everybody won't believe. People will think they can work it out with God later on. I've had people, I've witnessed it, said, I'll work it out with God when I get there. When you get there, it's too late. It's too late. You need to do it today. Today's the time. Let's see what we have from the last slide. I love this little girl. She says, teach me to follow Jesus. And the important part is at the bottom, if you can't see it, before the world teaches me how to follow them. And as parents, it's our responsibility. And many of us have fallen down on that responsibility. But our responsibility is to teach our children about Jesus. No matter what this world teaches them, it's the parents' responsibility to teach them about God's Word, teach them about Jesus Christ, the virgin-born baby, the one who went to the cross and died for your sin and my sin, the one who, when he was placed in the grave, only stayed there three days, and then he was raised to glory and his uh, glorified body to never die again. That's what we need to be teaching our kids, not this other nonsense that's going on right now. But if you let, if you let the school system be the ones that educate your kids, they'll never educate them about the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's what they need. They need that more than they need anything else. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this day. We pray, continue to pray for this storm that's going through right now. We pray everyone in its path will be, be looked after. There won't be a heavy property damage and nobody will be injured and uh, have their, their things destroyed. But Lord God, we just uh, give you praise and glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. For some reason, when I moved this over here, it stopped. It moved just too close. That could be. If you angle that black box out there a little bit, that might have stopped it. But I moved it and it stopped it. Okay. But I think they could hear you real good. Yeah, it was a good yeah. message. I think they can hear you real good. Yeah. She's a cutie. It could be that. Because we're, we're off the tightness of the room. Yeah. So I sit, if you sit it up on my hand and on the thing there and kept it balanced, and okay. I think it did okay. But I think we could hear everything. It was really good. Yeah.